Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India So the last class we were looking at the effect of pressure on uh, on the flame speed and what we found was for a nth order uh, reaction for let us say a global reaction um, the flame speed goes as uh, p to the n over 2 n minus 2 over 2 and uh, this basically gives a uh, weak pressure dependence. For a typical hydrocarbon oxidation uh, combustion reactions with a um, order close to two, a global order to close to two. So for uh, typically second order reactions, then there are lots of other parameters that we have to think about um, or, or variables. Of course when we talk about pressure the next thing we obviously think about is the effect of uh, initial temperature so uh, uh, or rather than saying initial temperature as if it is an unsteady problem and, and in a steady state situation we should be thinking about like a uh, effectively temperatures of the uh, un, un, uh, unburnt reactants okay or far upstream reactants so temperature effect of uh, temperature uh, reactant temperature. T not and now of course these things are more like information so you can actually gather these things from uh, most textbooks we will just go through this rather quickly to highlight what the most important aspects are and it is also important to think about this uh, in, in physical terms other than just to look at uh, explanations. Um, so what we are saying here is as far as T not is concerned. Uh, okay, the, the the gross effect is like if you now say SL, um, this goes that goes as T naught to the M. Let's say where M is around uh, uh, one point five to two. So if you think about this, if you now look at uh, SL versus T naught, you get graphs that go kind of like that, right? Um, so why is this? This is mainly a uh, preheating effect. Okay, see, so because what you're thinking about is we, we, you have the reactants that are approaching the flame in a flame fixed coordinate system, and then you have the preheat zone, and uh, the the temperature has to now raise from there up to the reaction temperature uh, in the reaction zone. So this this effect is primarily a uh, preheating effect. All right. So if you were to uh, be thinking about like a PhD qualifiers question, uh, the question will not be what happens to the flame speed with, with uh, the reactant temperature. The question would be what happens to the flame thickness with reaction temp, the, 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 the reactant temperature, right? So we will will ask this question differently than what's normally done in the class. Uh, so that that's for you to think about. <laughs> okay. Uh, so we say it is essentially a preheating effect. Now the other thing that you naturally have to think about uh, when you are looking at uh, the effect of anything on flame speed is what is the effect on the reaction rate because you know you, you, you see that the flame speed is directly proportional to square root of the reaction rate right. So as a matter of fact we got this n minus 2 over 2. Uh, for the pressure because the, the uh, reaction rate was going at speed to the n and then since the, the, the uh, flame speed is proportional to square root of w you have a n over 2 and then of course you had a 1 over density in the, uh, uh, as, a, as a factor out so which was linear in pressure therefore you had this n, n over 2 minus 1 that is how you got this. So the first thing that you have to think about is the reaction rate what is the effect of whatever parameter you are thinking about on the reaction rate and therefore on the uh, flame speed this is the first step approach uh, 
the next thing that you have to think about is what does the reaction rate itself depend on and it primarily depends on the flame temperature right. So what is the effect of anything on the flame temperature and through that on the reaction rate and through that on the flame speed this is how we have to look at this, this relationship that is very important uh, most of the time but in this case T0 of course affects Tf directly and, and then Tf affects W and W affects SL but in this case you know uh, the, the, the Tf effect is significant right when compared to the Tf effect the the influence the T0 has on the Tf and therefore on the SL is, is marginal this is so this this rise is primarily directly because of the preheating effect and much less through the effect through Tf. So uh, the, the, the influence through Tf is, uh, is less here. If you now look at how the Tf itself affects SL that is the next thing that we should look at uh, effect of flame temperature Tf on SL of course uh, is significant. So here what you will find is uh, uh, these curves are much steeper so if you now look at Tf this is of course like uh, we are essentially looking at different mixtures having different Tfs and what, what happens to the SL corresponding to that keeping lots of other things constant so it is, it is a bit difficult to actually think about this experiment but if you now think about this this, this, this curve is much steeper when compared to this okay. So uh, a, a slight change in Tf can cause a significant change in uh, SL. Through, through W that is the reaction rate so uh, now if you if you go back and think about this the first thing that we did was when we wanted to look at the structure of the premix flame we said uh, the, the reactants get in and then the temperature rises and then goes to the reaction zone but if you want to just do the, a gross order of magnitude balance you would say the, the reaction rate is evaluated at the flame temperature right we do not have to worry about the variation of the reaction rate with temperature we will just evaluate the reaction rate at the flame temperature directly and this justifies that because uh, as Tf changes W changes and as W changes SL changes there is a direct link between these, uh, these things. So uh, we, can, we can see this justified experimentally then the most important thing that we should be looking at most of the time effect of mixture ratio so when, when you say mixture we are always looking at the reactant mixture okay in, in the context of preheat uh, sorry premix flames uh, we are always thinking about the reactant mixture that means the fuel oxidizer mixture right so here what happens is um, SL versus let us say equivalence ratio and uh, of course you can think about equivalence ratio 1 as uh, stoichiometric and then less than 1 is fuel lean greater than 1 is fuel rich uh, you should typically look forward to curves that are like that with, with a peak little bit off in the fuel rich region okay so peak nearly uh, at stoichiometric Uh, condition or slightly fuel rich right now just to also give you some numbers we are talking about laminar uh, 
uh, flame speed. So, we are looking at uh, these things measured typically in centimeters per second and these are about uh, let us say 10, 20, 30, 40 these numbers would probably work for methane. L lots of other fuels will give you uh, these kinds of curves at much higher values maybe not much higher maybe uh, twice as much or maybe three times as much or so uh, around, around that. So we are talking about uh, a few to several tens of meters per second sorry a few, few to several tens of centimeters per second for the laminar flame speed okay. So th this is something that you got to keep in your mind and uh, uh, in order to get a feel for things when you do let us say experiments or even numerical work and so on. Um, now the other thing that we have to worry about is why, why are we having a peak that is slightly shifted off the reason for this is actually again through TF. So look at how the variation happens for the TF with respect to equivalence ratio right you will find that it, it picks up near the uh, uh, stoichiometric condition or maybe slightly fuel rich again and that is because of the CP effect that is the CP if you now look at how the CP of the mixture varies with phi right you will, you will find that uh, the CP affects the TF and then on top of it think about this TF is actually sitting in W and on top of and, and then there is a, an explicit CP dependence directly on a, uh, for, for SL okay. So the CP influences TF and CP directly also influences uh, SL therefore you will find a further slight shift into the fuel rich region because of this region this is this reason. So this is again again um, mimicking mimicking TF trend and a further CP effect we will look at the CP effect directly um, right away that means we want to keep the TF constant and see if we can vary the CP or so uh, that, that kind of thing. So let us let us just see how that can be done so effect of uh, effect of uh, alpha and CP right I want to just go back and point out something here in this picture uh, so th this, this curve stops on either side beyond a point as you go from uh, go, go away from equivalence ratio 1 and this would be uh, the um, fuel lean flammability limit and uh, this would be the fuel rich flammability limit that means if you now have too much of either fuel or oxidizer the flame is not going to propagate and that is called the flammability limit and uh, we will talk about flammability limits separately later on but we have to keep this in mind that this curve is going to actually hold only over a range of phi uh, around 1 uh, significantly around 1 it is not like just around 1 uh, but not too far away on either side okay. Um, so going back to the effect of alpha and CP alpha is of course the thermal diffusivity so uh, the way we can actually think about this is also pretty interesting uh, so you can now think about SL uh, and uh, versus phi if you now look at uh, uh, let us say CH4 in air right right consider uh, various oxi oxidizer inert mixtures right so that is like uh, O2 N2 as an air and uh, O2 organ and O2 helium all in the same proportions okay, so you keep the proportions the same you should now get uh, pictures that uh, look like that and this is for 
N2 with, with oxygen, this is for uh, uh, organ and this is for helium. So question is why, why are we getting this? We can think about it in, in, in multiple steps. The first thing that we want to think about is uh, this, this combination. Both of them are inert gases and monatomic, okay. So when you say they are monatomic, uh, then um, their CPs are nearly the same, right. And uh, the only thing that is different then is uh, the density, therefore the alpha changes. So the CP does not change, but the alpha changes. So if you, if you look at how the SL behaves, SL is like 1 over rho naught square root of um, KW divided by CP. These are, these are the uh, uh, dependencies. So K over rho CP is what we are looking for uh, as, uh, as alpha. So you should now be able to write K over CP uh, explicitly in terms of alpha and then you should be able to look at an alpha effect versus a um, uh, CP effect separately. That is what we are trying to do. So what you are saying here is because the helium is lighter than organ for the same CP, um, alpha of uh, uh, helium is, is much larger when, uh, than, than for uh, organ. Then for AR and uh, then what happens is you know you, you, can, you can fix your flame temperature all right. That means you can get your flame temperatures to be the same because the CP is the same. So flame temperature depends primarily on CP as far as this is concerned. So for the flame, same flame temperature uh, higher alpha, higher alpha uh, means higher SL alright. So that is the reason why you are going to get a uh, helium uh, uh, diluted SL to be uh, having a uh, higher value when compared to organ, organ diluted flame speed. Now then what happens to this combination? What you have to think about is here um, the CPs are different okay. So between organ and heal, uh, nitrogen this is a monatomic gas but this is a diatomic gas. So the, 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 therefore the CP is uh, different. Now N2 has a higher CP um, being diatomic okay relative to uh, organ, organ is a good comparison with uh, uh, N2 because the alphas are nearly the same okay for, for uh, same alpha so that, that way you can fix your alpha somewhat and, uh, uh, and then say um, look at the CP effect then what happens is SL, SL with N2 then becomes lower than um, SL with organ right. But then when you are thinking about change in CP right we started thinking about change in CP even here when we were talking about the SL variation with phi following a TF variation with phi trend. And then we were thinking about why was the TF actually varying like that and that we argued it through CP of the mixture as the phi is varied and therefore there was this trend that is shifting towards the fuel rich side. Uh, so similarly CP is now going to directly affect the flame temperature alright. So here what happens is um, um, TF also depends on CP. So here in the case of SL, SL varies through W and TF and therefore CP effect there and then an explicit CP dependence in the denominator therefore you now have a double effect both of them actually adding up together. So what happens is typically this gap is larger when compared to this gap because you now have both the CP influencing TF and then CP influencing directly okay. So 
TF uh, also depends on CP and uh, sorry uh, and uh, uh, it's it also affects SL. So keep that in mind. And then there are some more interesting things that we should be thinking about. Oh, uh, before we uh, proceed, this is a very interesting thing uh, as an experiment for you to do. And uh, we will sh shortly talk about like a Bunsen burner flame stabilization. All right. So uh, we, we will look at what's the condition for flame stabilization in a Bunsen burner, for example. And uh, then we will say. Okay, now I'm going to have like a methane air a mixture that is burning in a Bunsen flame, and uh, then I slowly shut off my nitrogen uh, in the air, and then try to introduce organ, and uh, then I progressively uh, shut off the organ, and then try to introduce uh, helium. Okay, so what happens to flame stabilization? So this is like a trick question that 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 that, that, is, that is typically asked in like qualifiers or exams, right? So we do not necessarily ask you directly about this that is like kind of reproducing what is there in the textbook right but we also try to couple this with the flame stabilization issue rig up an experiment where we can vary the diluent uh, type from nitrogen to argon to helium and ask progressively what happens to the flame shape in a Bunsen uh, flame and uh, uh, look at it look at its stabilization and so on. So effectively we are playing with the SL while you are trying to do that in relation to like the flames with the flow speed we will we will talk about that uh, later on so keep this in mind. Um, proceeding with uh, chemical effects so if effect of uh, molecular structure of fuel typically fuel is what is what is of interest the oxidizer, oxidizer is always air most of the time in what you are talking about or at least oxygen with, with any diluent. Um, now what we find is uh, two, two things we have to think about one uh, more unsaturated unsaturated saturated hydrocarbon higher is SL and saturated means you have like double bonds and triple bonds right. So it is not like alkanes we are now talking about alkenes alkynes those kinds of things um, they would they would have typically much higher SL when compared to uh, mm, when you have when you have only only have single bonds then the other thing that we should think about is uh, substituting um, methyl groups for hydrogen right leads to uh, SL decrease that means like for example when you now have uh, methane you have 4 hydrogen atoms right so instead of that you now say take, take, take one of the hydrogens and then you, you have CH3 CH3 that becomes ethane right and, and then uh, you, you can now have like CHCl3 or CCl uh, sorry, sorry, C, um, uh, C, 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 H, C, H, three twice, and then uh, C, C, H, three thrice. Uh, so you, you can progressively replace your uh, um, hydrogen atoms by methyl groups, and then form um, larger uh, molecules with more carbon atoms, and and, progress and and correspondingly hydrogen atoms as well in the, in the methyl groups. What this can lead to is two things one it implicitly also increases the number of carbon atoms okay. So if you now directly look at what happens to the SL as a function of number of carbon atoms right what you have to do is look at straight chain hydrocarbons like methane, ethane, propane, butane, pentane and so on all of them N uh, from, from, from propane onwards you have to think about like N propane and or n butane n pentane and so on right from from butane onwards you have to think about like uh, straight chains the other way uh, is like if you now take a methane and then start uh, uh, attaching methyl groups uh, 
you don't you, uh, progressively you don't you don't you, you now begin to get like for the butane you, it doesn't have to be n butane it could be like an isobutane that means like you have a branched methyl group um, even if you have straight chains as the number of carbon atoms increase the flame speed decreases provided we are talking about alkenes and alkynes with the case of in the case of uh, uh, alkanes there is hardly much of an effect. So uh, if, you, if you now look at the number of uh, carbon atoms um, you can look at like a curve that looks like this for alkanes a curve that looks like this for alkenes and a curve that looks like that for alkynes and these numbers are pretty uh, interesting. So this is like centimeters per second um, like for example you would have uh, something like uh, um, 50, 100, 150, 200 and uh, 250 and so on keeps you see this now of course when you are now talking about alkynes you are looking at a triple bond so obviously you need to have at least three carb two carbon atoms for a triple bond to be formed in between so this is like acetylene and, and you can see that acetylene has a very very high um, flame speed uh, for, for two reasons one the number of carbon atoms is less and it is unsaturated it is highly unsaturated so both of them contribute to uh, uh, a, a high flame speed so 3 is number of carbon atoms leads to SL decrease more with an un unsaturated and uh, one more thing that you have to think about is uh, when you now have uh, a, a, a increase in the number of carbon atoms there is a molecular weight effect that is coming in okay. So uh, additional effect is fuel molecular weight. fuel molecular weight right and uh, uh, so this this actually influences your alpha for the mixture and through that you, you, you also so one thing is the reactivity right so that means you, it affects the reaction rates the other thing is the molecules are getting heavier and heavier so it, it influences your alpha and from there you are beginning to get um, an effect on the SL. So these these two things compound and mix for example acetylene to be highly reactive so, so that is the reason why people say if you are working with something like an oxyacetylene torch like in welding applications and so on you got to be a bit careful uh, I should not say a bit careful maybe quite careful <laughs> okay uh, on, on safety considerations because uh, it is highly reactive and uh, in fact I should point out that here we are not looking at uh, a TF effect uh, TF note. TF and as a matter of fact even the activation energies uh, for like let us say global reactions of oxidation of most of these fuels are comparable right. So this is not necessarily like a TF effect at all. So uh, then the other last point that I would like to make is about uh, uh, chemical reactivity. So uh, a good comparison that is made is for example if you now have a uh, silicon hydrogen bond versus uh, silicon carbon bond like SiH4 similar to CH4 right SiH4 would probably have like a large reaction uh, what do you call uh, uh, flame speed okay. So this is because this, this bond is actually uh, <coughs> quite reactive when compared to uh, let us say for example if you now progressively replaced uh, the carbon atoms in methane with silicon right and you go all the way to having SiH4 versus you can say I am sorry uh, SiCH3H2 uh, and so on. So if you, if you now have some, some such thing that would be less reactive. 
So if you now have like a silicon carbon bond that is going to be less reactive when compared to silicon hydrogen bond. So these are things that you can pick up from textbooks not, not, a very, not very difficult but what you have to keep in mind is to highlight two or three things one have a feel for numbers okay we are talking about tens or few tens to several tens typically for most flame speeds in terms of centimeters per second you can also look at some of these having a few hundreds of centimeters per second that is that's, that's one thing. The second thing always look for the effect of any of these things through TF okay because that is a big effect there are only a few exceptions for example T0 there is a direct effect of, of preheating um, and then uh, there is a direct CP effect that you can think about and uh, uh, TF does not really influence significantly when you are thinking about uh, different fuels uh, in, in, uh, uh, with, with different carbon chains. So there is a molecular effect and so on that is coming to picture. So some of these uh, are, are exceptional but most of the time uh, whatever TF does with whatever parameter they are thinking, thinking about SL would try to follow that most, mostly. So uh, and then uh, keep, keep this shape in mind this and then of course what happens when you now progressively diluted with different uh, gases of different uh, mono, monatomic or diatomic gases and then also when you have different uh, uh, molecular weights or densities and so on. So this is this is pretty uh, interesting as well. Now with this what we should now try to do is a slightly different framework once we now know how to deal with uh, how to get the flame speed then how do we deal with premix flames so then we talk about what is called as the G equation so what happens when you are thinking about a G equation is when the flame is uh, much thinner much thinner than the hydrodynamic uh, length scale of the flow right we can treat this flame as like a surface uh, a surface that is propagating in the flow so it is essentially like a surface of discontinuity uh, the flame can be treated as a surface of discontinuity right uh, propagating in the flow that means the flame has a certain propagation speed which we now kind of take for granted we have gone through enough of what is happening across the flame within the flame how the temperatures rise the concentrations fall for the reactants lots of things and, and then we now have the preheat zone the reaction zone we could have like multiple preheat zones for non unity Lewis numbers depending upon um, diffusion length scale versus conduction length scale lots of such things we have think thought about right and then we have also further thought about what are the effects of pressure temperature uh, flame temperature all these things. But now let us say flame speed is given right if the flame speed is given and you are now talking about a situation where the characteristic length scale of your flow is much larger when compared to the flame thickness okay and the flame is not very very thick many times a laminar flame for example is just very very thin right it is about a few millimeters thick. Uh, of course it, it, it is much it is quite thicker than a shock like if you are thinking about gas dynamic shock that is that is only a few mean free parts thick okay uh, you have a sudden change in properties across a very very small distance uh, where, where even uh, uh, continuum assumptions are uh, broken down whereas uh, that is not the case with flames but still it is quite thin when compared to most applications uh, where, where, where you come across most applications. Therefore, 
if you now think about this you now say that is the flame which is now beginning which is trying to propagate into a flow right. Now where was all the preheat zone and all those things it is kind of like you now have to take a magnifying glass hold it against this right and then that is going to kind of look like and so on all the stuff that we drew and uh, so it is almost like locally one dimensional. So when you now say locally one dimensional that means the flame is trying to propagate with its flame speed normal to itself right. So the flame could be curved that refers to the flame shape whereas what we have been talking about so far is what is called as the flame structure a flame shape is like a much global, global picture a flame structure is something that happens almost like at a point in the flame along the length of the flame right where you now try to spatially resolve temperature and concentration profiles reaction rate profiles all those things across the thickness of that flame. So what we are talking about is locally normal to itself it is going to have a flame speed which is now of course going to be in different directions flame speed is a scalar right and it depends mainly on reactant temperatures pressure reactant temperature pressure uh, and uh, the, the, the uh, mixture ratio all right and, and uh, the, the um, uh, all, all, the, all the all the other parameters like what is the alpha what is the CP and um, and uh, uh, what are the kinetic constants what is the order of the reaction all these things right. So once all those things are given if you are given a certain mixture at a particular ratio and temperature and pressure SL is fixed as a scalar. The flame speed acquires a direction locally normal to the flame shape so dependent upon the shape of the flame is how the flame propagation direction is fixed and many times you would think wait a minute the flame is probably going to shape itself depending upon how it can propagate right and I, and I would have to try to find the shape in the first place depending upon how it can propagate if I do not know how it is going to prop, propagate how, how can I figure out what its shape is and how can I figure out the propagation direction so it is a loop that we have to think about so how do you do this right so the way we deal with this situation is we now say this is actually treated as a surface of discontinuity and we want to mathematically describe the surface by a uh, by an equation called g of x vector comma t is equal to 0 right. So the geometry of the surface can be um, represented uh, as g of x vector comma t equal to 0 x vector referring to the position vector uh, for that particular position there. Now if you are trying to do this analytically you could just deal with this surface having this equation right as it is or the other possibility is you can now think of g as a scalar like enthalpy or uh, temperature or uh, any anything okay a, a just just like any scalar. So it is sort of like if you now have and particularly what is called as a passive scalar that means a scalar that does not influence the flow okay. So if you now kind of have a scalar quantity that is actually dropped in the flow it just goes with the flow right unless it has a propagation speed that it wants to compete the, with the flow against right so that is the kind of thing that we want to see so if you want to look at it as a scalar that means it is a scalar field that means it, it, it should be this it should be defined or and described everywhere in your flow field right. So if you want to do that then the, the, there is a way of, way of dealing with this that is you can say um, g less than 0 could, could refer to the unburnt 
state and g greater than 0 could refer to the burnt state that means all reactants have a value the reactant field now should be assigned a value of g that is less than 0 and the product field should be assigned a value of g that is greater than 0 and what happens in in the entire field as you now solve for g is the g rapidly rises across 0 within a very very thin narrow region. Mathematically speaking it is almost instantaneously happening that is why it is a surface of discontinuity at the, at the flame all right that means it is having a value that is less than 0 up to the flame it is now suddenly jumping to a value that is greater than 0 um, on the other side numerically like if you want to now look do like uh, computation like right, right okay discretized uh, approximate numerical calculations you could now think about some values from let us say minus 1 to plus 1 and look for a, a, a contour or a surface where typically when you discretize your space over maybe about 2 or 3 grid points you now have a sudden rise in G right. So that is like a uh, approximate way of do, doing the flame but effectively we are looking at something like this. So what you want to do is uh, as I said SL itself is scalar so it, it acquires the direction normal to the flame therefore you need to actually define a unit normal vector unit normal vector uh, we are of course assuming the flame surface to be uh, continuous and smooth all right um, that means so it, it is important to actually have a continuous and smooth flame as an assumption because at every point you need to be able to define a unit normal. So if it is not smooth and it is kind of having like a cusp then you, you are going to have multiple unit normals at that, at that point which is ill defined right. So you cannot really allow for cusps to happen uh, so that is like saying it is really not smooth uh, but it is still continuous but there are situations when actually the flame gets cut right but even when the flame gets cut it actually tries to coil around and then make like a circle and then start um, consuming reactants that are entrapped within this zone. So uh, momentarily you might you might find some discontinuities but uh, pretty soon you are going to get something to be to, to be made continuous so it is not terribly bad uh, assumption. Uh, so what you are saying is under these kinds of assumptions we now say we, we can define a local normal uh, like minus grad g divided by mod grad g and uh, we take n hat as positive. Uh, positive when pointed upstream we need to have a convention on this and then hat is taken as positive and pointed upstream okay. So then what you do is we want to now have an evolution equation for G how does the G equation evolve or how does the the, the C the, the, the surface described by G equal to 0 evolve right. So the evolution equation is obtained by adopting a Lagrangian system that means you now sit on the flame or you ride the flame of course it is going to be pretty hot out there okay if you are able to bear that okay so you are going to have some fun sitting on the flame right what happens as you sit on the flame and it is doing whatever it is doing you are there I mean you are not nothing is nothing is happening because you are always sitting on the flame right all the fun can be seen only if you now view from outside like in a laboratory fixed coordinate system you can see the flame movement. So the Lagrangian frame of reference says that on the flame surface right dg over dt equal to 0. The reason why we use a ordinary derivative is your, your space is fixed by the location of the flame you are on, you're on g equal to 0. And uh, the only thing that is that is varying is time right and then we are saying that the g is going to be invariant in time because you are sitting there nothing is happening while you are sitting there. This in fact is what is typically written as capital G over capital 
d t in an Eulerian frame of reference. Then with respect to an Eulerian frame of reference if you now pull yourself out right you will now call this the material derivative right. So this would then mean in, a, in an Eulerian frame of reference we have to write this as partial g with, with respect to time because g partially changes with respect to time uh, besides there is an apparent change with respect to time uh, because of its motion uh, uh, right therefore we have to say uh, capital V f vector dot grad g equal to 0 this is essentially partial d partial d over dt plus v dot del of g so this is a this is an operator that is acting on g uh, that essentially is basically trying to say so what is what is vf now vf is nothing but dx over dt right that is essentially the position vector corresponding to where the g is um, and its change in time so that means it is essentially the displacement uh, of, of the points along the flame um, the, uh, taken as derivative with respect to time to get the uh, flame, flame motion. So this is actually the local so this is just like local propagation velocity. right now when you say local propagation velocity it is sort of relative to something that is very local it is not thinking about a flow field that is around it it is trying to have a relative motion of the flame with respect to the flow around right. So this, this then by definition of the way uh, SL is right SL is nothing but the vf minus the flow velocity v vector evaluated at g equals 0 minus this is corresponds to the upstream reactant velocity at the flame dot n hat right. So this is to say that you are going to have a relative velocity between the flame movement and the and the flow that is manifesting as a cell if your flow were quiescent right or, or if your reactants were quiescent then you will identically have the flame propagation velocity that we talked about as the flame, flame speed okay except we have to now consider the dot product because you have to look at the local normal propagation right otherwise you would not get a scalar out of, of this vector or you could not have made a vector out of the scalar either way you can look at this right. So if you now say uh, so V then is the local flow velocity in uh, lab frame right that is the Eulerian frame and uh, from here we can get if you now plug this back here you can get uh, in this equation you can get plus V obtained uh, at g equals 0 minus dot grad g uh, equal to SL mod grad g that is substitute for n as minus grad g divided by mod grad g and you should be able to get this right. So this is what is called as the G equation the G equation essentially is an evolution equation for the flame surface as if it is a surface it is a surface of discontinuity across which the temperature changes from the unburnt temperature to the burnt pro, unburnt reactant temperature to the burnt product temperature and the reactant concentrations become 0 for particularly the, uh, uh, the deficient reactant and uh, product concentrations go from 0 to uh, whatever is the uh, final pr product value and so on okay we will stop here at this at this stage I will see you at 3 o'clock tomorrow.